Good to see you. God is good, amen? amen? I'll tell you what, God is doing a new thing. And while I cannot give too much away, I have breaking news. Some good news. I have good news and I have bad news. What do you want first? The good news is, <laughs> good news is God is on the move and there is some amazing stuff that has happened. The bad news is I can't tell you all of it yet because it is so hot off the press. I'm talking literally this past Friday, a door opened for the future of our church that honestly, previously, before Friday, had been closed. And I am like, I am trembling. I'm so excited. I'm like a giddy little middle school girl. I just want to jump up and down right now. And middle school boy. I should say middle school boy, but that's just weird. Okay, so anyway, I had a great meeting this past Friday, and I covet your prayers. I have another meeting this week with our leadership team. We're going to be discussing, and we're going to be praying about some really, really God-sized big things that are bigger than I anticipated uh, for the future of our church. Uh, including locations and campuses and all kinds of stuff, some permanence. Um, and it is one of those things that is so like, oh my goodness, that it, it actually frightens me. These songs today, thank you, Jason, they were for me, about getting out of the boat and stepping out in faith. You are good because, I mean, it's, it is awesome. God is on the move, not just in our church, but I'm meeting with so many pastors in this area, and there is pockets of revival that are breaking out. But revival today looks a little different than revival did 75 years ago. See, 75 years ago, people would dress up, and they would go into an unair-conditioned canvas tent in humid, hot, summertime cities, and they would get in things, and they would look like this. Tion's got a picture here for you that shows you. They would sit on wooden folding chairs. Let me repeat one word, unair-conditioned. Let's be honest. That would eliminate about 90% of us right there. And I'd be leading the charge. Because that's just, that's, that's suffering for Jesus. That's the real thing. And in these times, when you would come into the, 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 the crusade or the revival camp, you would see a sign often. And the sign would have some kind of thing like, come expect a miracle, supernatural <laughs> explosion. I love that. That's not like something I would write, you know. Like, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. It's going to be awesome. And, you know, and it's hyperbole. And it's like a supernatural explosion. What is that? But God would show up, and he would move, and there would be hundreds, if not thousands of people who would end up raising their hand, who would invite the Holy Spirit to come into their life, to change them, to forever, from this day forward, we surrender, we walk with you, God, you be the center of my world. You sit on the throne of my heart. Let me be something less. And, and we see that, and we look, and we think, Pastor, how come we don't see revivals like that anymore? And you know what? We might be, but it doesn't look like that. I think we're looking for the wrong signs. I think the question really for us is not why don't we see God move like that anymore because God is always moving. He is always on the move, always doing something. Maybe our eyes are blinded to see it or maybe it's just not happening to us, so therefore we assume it's not happening anywhere. I think the better question is why doesn't a movement of God look like that anymore? Well, that's a, that's a question worth probing. See, first off, we have to understand the difference between a crusade and a revival. Because there's a huge difference. It's subtle. Take the great Billy Graham crusades. When they would pack in these tents and people would come in and they would have thousands of people come to know the Lord, they were designed in targeting the unsaved. They were designed to target the unchurched and the lost. That's what a crusade does. A revival is something altogether different. Those are targeted towards you and me. To the saved. Those are people who have already been born again, people who already know the Lord, and their, their fire may just need a stoking, where they just want a fresh blowing of the Holy Spirit in their life to charge them up. You see what I'm saying? You can't revive something that has never been vived. <laughs> Does that make sense? You can only revive that which has been first vived. So that is for the saved, and there's, it's a totally different critter altogether. Revival is different than a crusade, and God is doing both, and he's able to. I read a great article by Brandon Cox, and he was talking about a book about what was happening over in England, and he cited the old Celts. Remember the, 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 the Celtics and the Celtics and all those? And they have a book called The Wild Goose Chase. It was written by Mark Batterson, and in this, he mentions the old Celtic term for the Holy Spirit. You know what they refer to the Holy Spirit as? The wild goose. Here's some symbols that they would use frequently. Here you have the goose over here, and here's the 
the universal symbol of the Trinity, the never-ending three circles. You see them, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then here's another one where they actually combined the image. You can see the triune God represented in the wings. Why did they call him this? It wasn't anything sacrilegious. It wasn't trying to be disrespectful in any way. They thought of the Holy Spirit as always there, but just kind of slightly out of grasp, elusive. Like, we really can't, can't grab it. Like, you ever try to chase a goose? <laughs> You're sitting there trying to catch it? You know me, I love farm work and outdoors, and I, I, I go with gooses all the time. <laughs> Well, you're laughing at it. That means you're on to me. So I've read about it in books, that there are things like gooses and geese and whatever, and, and, and you can't catch them. A better definition of this, it, 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 the Holy Spirit is sovereign, and he works where he chooses, when he chooses. He is not our puppet. He is not a genie in the sky where we rub a lamp and say, give me my three wishes. He's not this cosmic Santa where we come with our wish list, spend two minutes in prayer. We're going to come to that. Oh, go ahead and put your steel-toed boots on. A little, little warning here. To put it another way, if and when revival happens, and it is, it is happening, it probably won't look like it did before. Why is that? Well, God may be doing old things, but he's doing them in new and fresh ways. And it is exciting. There is, there, this is why we don't expect to see... God talking back to us through a donkey very often. Remember Balaam and the talking donkey with a horse turn? None of us who ride horses really probably expect the horse to turn around and deliver a word from the Lord, right? I and mean, if you do, that's awesome, but I don't hear about it. Nor, if we're being chased by our enemies and we come up to Jordan Lake, do we expect to see Jordan Lake part <laughs> and us walk through on dry land and then the enemies get washed away. Can God do that? Absolutely. Did it really happen? I totally believe that. God does things differently in each age, and it's up to us to notice what he's doing. So know that God is doing a new thing. Turn with me to Isaiah 43. I want to look at something amazing here. If you're not sure where Isaiah is, you haven't had your quiet time in Isaiah lately, find the middle of your Bible, find Psalms, make a right turn. Go a couple books over, you'll be in the neighborhood. While you pull that up, let me welcome those who are joining us online, streaming with us. It's great to have you too. Isaiah chapter 43, and let me set the context for what's about to happen here. Context is so important on this. Isaiah chapter 43 is basically a message to the suffering people of Israel. Isaiah shows up and he is about to drop a huge word on these people, a word consisting of just two letters, I, F, if. And this is a loaded word, y'all. He, he's gonna drop this on these people and, and he's saying, people of Israel, you have sinned. You have missed the point. You have missed the boat in following the Lord. You have turned away from him. So God tells me to tell you that I am about to allow you to go through punishment. But just as I delivered you as a nation before, I can do it again. I will do it again if, there it is, if you repent and you come back to me. And then God begins to list amazing things he's done. And he starts to go through this thing and all these previous awesome works. Read with me here, starting in, in verse 16. I am the Lord who opened the way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. I called forth the mighty army of Egypt with all its chariots and its horses. I drew them beneath the waves and they drowned. Their lives were snuffed out like a smoldering candle. Do we grasp this? Do we really understand what's happening here? God is reminding the people and, and all these great things are being cited off, and he's right, and that he's so accurate, because every time he speaks, he's right, and he's true. And I could just picture the Israel uh, just cheering him on, saying, yeah, yeah, that's right, God, do it again. He's like, I am the Lord. You are the Lord, right? You picture this. I opened the way through the waters. Yeah, do it again. I, I made a dry path. That's right, you did, God. And they're cheering, and I drowned your enemies, right? I took it. Right. Yeah, woo, do it again. And they're high five, and I can just picture this, and they're having a great time. And God's like, yeah, do it again, do it again. And God says, forget all that. Wait, what? And I can just picture the Israel church looking at each other going, did I just hear that right? For, forget all, he, he, God didn't say that. And he does. He says something so shocking to him. He says, forget all that. But God, you don't understand. We can't forget that because we want you to do that 
again. You see where this is going? God, we, 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 want, we don't want to just reminisce about the past. We want you to do those miracles. you got to do that again, Lord. That's what we're used to. That's what we're comfortable with. And I want to see you do that. In fact, let's just say it. We want a duplication of those great things from the previous generations that we only read about in books. That's what we want you to do for us, God. And God says, forget all that. Why? Keep reading with me. Look at the next verse. Forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do. For I am about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. It goes on to outline some beautiful things to come. That, that, that's another sermon altogether. But in other words, God is saying, oh, I am moving. I am hearing you. I am delivering you. I am doing an old thing. I'm reviving my people, but I'm going to do it in a new way, a way you may not have witnessed before. And perhaps that's why we don't fully recognize what God is doing. We keep searching for pockets for old revival that we've heard about from days gone by because it's comfortable. It's comfortable for us to remember that. I always get nostalgic around Christmas. I start thinking about things and, you know, it's kind of like we long for the past because it's like that comfortable pair of blue jeans that's faded and it fits so good. Well, maybe it used to fit good. (laughs) It's not fit so good lately. Or maybe it's a pair of sweatpants for you or yoga pants or Lulu, Lulu Roman Smiths. What are they called? The Lulu, Lulu, Whatever, yeah, those, those little stretchy things. <laughs> Guys, you better not be wearing those either because if you're wearing your ladies' yoga pants, see me after church. We got a problem. I know they're comfortable. I've heard all about it, but that is just wrong. You should not be wearing anything that skinny, especially on a dude. And I just wanted to go on record saying that because I've seen some of your Facebook posts. <clears throat> but uh, put, putting that aside, we long for the comforts of the past. We long for things that feel good. Dr. Hawkins writes about a special memory he has from a recent Christmas. And he said he's passing through the kitchen, and his wife is in there surprising him, making all his favorite dishes, pumpkin pie, crescent rolls or croissants, if you are educated like that, and all kinds of of yummy things, honey honey spiral baked ham and all those things that that I don't know how to cook, but I eat, and they're awesome. And he goes in, and he's like, what is that heavenly smell? And all of a sudden, he looks down, and he sees a card yellowed with age, and he goes... That's my mom's handwriting. Turns out his wife is surprising him with the recipe of his mom's favorite dish. And she's making it. And he looks and he's like, oh, and he gets all excited. Now, y'all are looking at the recipe right now trying to figure out what she's cooking, right? That's not the real card. All right, so, but just while we're stopped, notice that even back then, 75 years ago, the debate was raging of how you spell ketchup. Is it? Is it ketchup? Is it ketchup? Is it ketchup? And they've even crossed it out. I didn't do that. That's not Photoshop. That's a real old recipe. It's just not the one Hawkins was talking about. What he did is he looked at it and he said, this reminded me of home. And here was the lesson. When the recipe was followed precisely and the directions said, you know, it it was perfect, it tasted just like his mom used to make, even though she was already with the Lord. Even though somebody else was following the recipe, Different from the original source, it still worked. You're all smiling because this brings back familiar memories. We love mom's cooking or grandma's cooking, and we go back and we think it's so, so familiar. And just like that, we long for something we recognize, but maybe just a little bit newer or something a little bit more, maybe a fresh, new spiritual refreshing that comes through to take our faith to brand new heights, a personal revival, if you will. The great news is this. God has revealed his recipe for revival. In fact, he's revealed it several times. All throughout the Old Testament, you'll see a familiar pattern that was applicable to the the followers of the early days, but also is applicable to us. One of the few things you can almost take and layer and take it out of context, and it still stands on its own, God's call to holiness. One of those recipes, probably the most famous one, is found in 2 Chronicles 7.14. This is where the people of Israel followed a divine recipe for a while. And when they did, they experienced God's favor and God's blessing. And it was awesome. And they loved it. But sometimes they didn't follow the recipe. So let's look at the ancient recipe from Scripture together. Here it is, 2 Chronicles. It says, If my people 
who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Now, a lot of people trot out this verse every 4th of July and they apply this to America. And while that can be applicable, I want to do something totally different. I'm not going to do that. In fact, I'm glad we didn't do this on 4th of July. I want us to not look at this from man's perspective. Because that's what we like to do. And that becomes very man-centered and very self-centered. We don't mean to do it, but that's just how we view things. It's our eyes, our body, our world. We view things naturally from our point of view. So let's do this. Let's pull back and view this from the throne. As best we can, let's look at God's viewpoint on this verse. See, right away, we see clearly God has a desire to send fresh revival to his people, a fresh blowing of his spirit. He is willing, he is waiting, he is longing. He wants to send revival, but notice he doesn't overrule your will. He never forces himself. Consequently, in a very real sense, revival is always the sovereign work of Almighty God, but in this case, it is clearly conditional, and we are not comfortable with that. That makes it sound like it's almost like a work. Wait a minute, are you talk is this kind of like a James kind of thing? Uh, a weird, like you got to earn? <laughs> Not at all. Check it out. Look clearly. Don't miss the very first word in this passage. God clearly says, if. You know what that means? He's saying, if my conditions are met, then certain results will follow. This is powerful. Don't miss this. Before I entered the ministry, Even before I was the lead singer in my rock and roll days, way before that, when I was just a wee little snapper, I was following my dad in his footsteps towards NASA scientists, computers, and engineering. I know it strikes you as funny because it strikes me as funny. It's okay to laugh at that. That's why I brought proof. I have a picture from 1982. This is me with hair, and this is my dad. Now, we're playing with one of those little kits where you could hook wires up and you could kind of program that make a little light go off or a little buzz or buzzer or something. And I see people, they still have these today. I want you to notice something else in this picture. Tiana, if you need to go to blackout for a second, you can to let this show up just a little bit. This right here, don't be jealous of what's in the top corner, Masters of the Universe. This is a Castle Grayskull that came. That's not what I was excited about. It was this right here. This is a personal computer. This was a new thing. This is, this is before Atari, this is before the Apple IIe and the Apple IIc. What the Commodore was, we have this. This is before the Commodore 64. This is the Commodore VIC-20. <laughs> Even William Shatner endorsed this. It is the best computer value in the world today. The only computer you will need for years to come. And I kid you not, it came with 5K. That was the memory. You have more in your watch. But that'll last you for years. Who will need more? And I loved it. And I took this thing upstairs, and I plugged it in, and I started programming. And I loved it. And I started programming, and I would get books, and I would sit there and talk about, oh, wow, what what if we do this? 10, print, Matt is cool. And then 20, go to 10. It would print, Matt is cool, Matt is cool, Matt is cool, Matt is cool, Matt is cool. Just over and over down the screen, right? Y'all remember this? Is this just me? Okay, it's just me. All right, fine. And, And I'm printing this. And then I come to this bizarre statement. I'm going somewhere with this, I promise. This is deep. There was a statement called, if then. Oh, this is gold, y'all. What that is, when I got to a computer, a coding, a line here, it would say, if x equals 10, then go to line 40. Or go sub a different routine. If this is true, then go do this. If this is not true, then don't do that. You see what I'm saying? It was an if-then statement. Y'all, that is exactly what God is showing here. This is the ultimate if-then statement. God is saying, and don't miss this, if you, if my people will do four things, I will do three. He's very clearly saying, if you will do four things, I will do three. Let me address the colossal jewel right here that is sitting in front of us. God is offering you something. He is offering you a bargain. When God offers you a bargain, Take it. Take it. It is for your good. It is to move you to a higher level of spiritual maturity. God is offering us a bargain here. Do these four things. And, he, and, and yeah, I know it was written to those back then, back in Second Chronicles day, but you're going to see a pattern here today of holiness that God is still using. If my people will do this, 
then I will do this. The real story behind revival, if you go back and look in any kind of history, it always comes back to God's people repenting. It's not the culture. It's not the world. It is us being convicted of sin and neglect and apathy, and we begin to seek his throne for a fresh wind of his spirit. Every single great awakening can be traced back to one godly man or one godly woman who was broken before the Lord and sought him in prayer. Every great revival and awakening started that way. You can eventually trace it all the way back to someone who was broken before the Lord, who was desperate for what the psalmist calls fresh oil. And it is a beautiful thing. So with that said, let me be brutally honest, and I want to offer just a diagnosis today of the modern church. If you go to the doctor and he gives you a diagnosis for disease, this is what you might hear. You might hear a report. A spiritual doctor might look at the condition of many people today, especially in the American church that is very blessed, very fat, happy, and content, right? I'm just being honest. The diagnosis I would give it today would be a disease called apathy. It's not bad. It's not like, oh, you know, not antagonistic. They're just kind of content, kind of apathetic. We're, you know, we've been blessed. We've done good. Here's the deal. It's not out there. It's not the lost world that has the apathy. It's here. It's his own people. It is so easy for us to point out there at the decay in the culture. It is so easy for us. I do this to say, I can't believe they would do that. Oh, what wickedness to see the, the, the effects of the decaying moral society and, the, and the, the, the ravages of secular progressivism and godless things being forced on us and stuff. It's so easy to get them, God, and righteous anger and, and do that. But God says, didn't say if those people <laughs> will humble themselves. He said if my people, those who are called by his name. You know what Christian means? It means little Christ. It means we emulate him. Wow. We might want to kick it up a notch. If we are the reflection of that, the majesty of God residing on us, man, we got to, it's, it's not them, it's for us. Jesus addressed this. He says, guys, quit looking at the outside world. He told this great little parable about, you might remember, this small little splinter in, in the neighbor's eye. And the guy comes up and goes, oh my goodness, please let me help you take that splinter out of your eye. When all the time you've got this two by four sticking out of your own eye. I love this. Dude, I think I got something in my eye. Hey, don't worry. I'll help you get it out. Really? Really? The humor of Jesus, don't miss that. He was not some dour uh, walking around in rows with his hands clasped. Man, he was smacking people with the truth. It was awesome. And today, he still does it. So quickly, I want to walk you through the four things that God was talking about here that he required back then before he sent revival. Look back with me at 2 Chronicles one more time. If my people, notice right away God's first demand. He is calling his people to humble themselves. Woo, doggy to humble themselves, to recognize and confess their need for him and to seek him. Notice what he starts with. It all begins with humility. Is this easy? Yeah. If there's one thing I'm proud of, it's my humility, right? That's, that's, that's how we feel. But if you don't believe me, just ask me. I'll tell you. I am humble. That's, this is what we do. You know, we even have a hashtag, hashtag humble brag. Where we kind of brag, but we're looking humble about it. And we do, you know what I'm saying? And this is where God is saying, oh, no, no, no. You must avoid the temptation to be spiritually puffed up. There is no room for pride. We are no better than anyone else. The Christian has to be humble and broken before the Lord. It is precious in his sight. He even says so. So that's step one. How you doing so far? All right, some of us have tripped on first base. That's okay. There's four bases to go, and you're safe here. We all trip. Okay, get back up. Look at step number two he talked about. The second thing God calls his people to do is pray. Oh my goodness, it's getting worse. Pray, this is not just a reciting of verses or reciting of memorized litanies of words just going up, bouncing off the, the, the roof or, or rolling off our tongue. That's not prayer. In fact, I don't even like to use that word prayer because what that does, that conjures up us bringing our list to God and he's our Santa Claus. And we usually start asking for material things material needs, and some of that is completely valid and completely appropriate, but not if that is the extent of our prayer time. If that is the extent of our prayer life, you don't serve a God, you serve a genie. Okay? This is, 
this isn't for you. This is just for me. Okay, I'm just preaching to me today so y'all can smile and relax. It's okay. I know that this hits me before it hits, ever hits you. We don't like to think about being still before God. We don't like to think about meditating on his word or, or, or even spending time in contemplation. You know why? Because it sounds too Buddhist or it's too hipster. Oh, let's just meditate. Come together and we'll wear our skinny jeans and we'll grow out our mutton chops and we'll light a candle and we'll all park our Prius out front. Y'all, this is, <laughs> I don't know where that came from, sorry. Was, <laughs> I don't have anything against Prius, I promise. I don't know. I don't, hang on, I'm going to get a drink. We, <laughs> where was I? When we begin to talk about prayer as that monologue, we, we, we rob ourselves of being in God's presence. We rob ourselves of... Prayer is not a monologue. I've said it before, and I'll try to remind us every quarter prayer is a dialogue where you speak and then you listen. We don't like to do that because we like to do this. Remember about a year ago, I think I mentioned, I said, do we like silence? And then I got quiet. I said, let's just see how awkward this is, and I said nothing. <laughs> we just stared at each other and heard crickets. Awkward. We don't like to do that. We like to fill it up. You know why? Can I be brutally honest? Because being in God's presence and meditating on him thinking of his attributes and giving him private, even silent worship and contemplating him. It changes us and it feels awkward and it feels unproductive at first. Unproductive. God, I don't have time to sit here on this, on, on this altar and kneel. Don't you know I've got stuff to do, right? Lord, I've got time. For you. <laughs> you have three minutes and 80 seconds. That would be four minutes and I guess 10, 20 seconds. And you're sitting there and you're thinking about all the things you want to say to the Lord. You fill up your time and then you got to go because i got to get in my car. i got carpool. i got this. i got a job. i got things to do. Prayer is the most productive thing we can do. Meditating and contemplating God is the most productive. We don't like it. Don't believe me? Try this tomorrow. I give you permission. Okay? Go to your boss and say, my pastor said I could do this. Okay? Do that. I, and I want to hear how that goes just by itself. Go to him or her and say, my pastor told me that I'm supposed to request 30 minutes of productive silence today. And I'm going to do that right here on the floor. And I'm just going to sit here because it's supposed to make me more productive. Okay? Try that tomorrow. Tell me what your boss says. He's going to say two words. You're fired. Or pink slip. Right? Why? Because that is so counterintuitive. That's not productive. Spending time with the Lord, listening to him, y'all, contemplation is what clears the mind. It's what clears the heart. It's what allows God to speak things to us like grace and peace and wisdom and clarity. And what is your next step for you? Do you want to know? That's how you find it. Richard Foster has a beautiful quote on this. He says this. He says, what happens in meditation is we create this emotional and spiritual space which allows Christ to be able to construct an inner sanctuary of the heart. That's awesome. This is so foreign in Western countries. Y'all, even secular science doesn't doubt the power here. Take the spiritual out of it. You know what they found? They found those who willingly calm themselves and spend time in meditation and prayer. It decreases stress, depression, anxiety, and it actually makes them more productive. This is the wascally, wicked, secular, atheist type people. And they even understand. Take God out. Now add God into it and see God will revive our souls. So how's your prayer life? Just thought I'd slip in that little question. Don't answer out loud. What would you give yourself on a scale of 1 to 10? Where would you rank yourself? Let's just be very practical. A 5? Okay. 10? Woo! Took all I could do to get you to come out of your prayer closet this morning to get here, and it's the first thing you're going to run back to, right? That's a 10. Is it a 1? Is it non-existent? Is it maybe? Same grace? Dear Lord, thank you for that Bojangles I had this morning. That, that Bowberry biscuit is awesome. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I'll talk to you tomorrow, same time, at breakfast. Man, that's, that's, that's how a lot of self-professing believers think of prayer. That's why I didn't want to use the P word. I wanted to say contemplation or meditation or something that was far more transformative. Look at the third thing God talks about here. He demands that we seek his face. Woo, buckle up. It didn't say, seek his hand. Think about that. That's not an accident. He said, if my people will seek my face. He said this to Jeremiah. You will seek me, and you'll find me when you seek with me for all your heart. When you seek with me 
all your heart. That's, that's what he's saying. He says, I'm not elusive. I'm not hiding. I'm not the wild goose. If believers today spend as much time seeking his face as we do his hand, revival would have already swept the land. But what do we do? We come, we bring our list, right? It's okay. You're safe here. You can smile. I've been there. I've done it. God, here's what I need for today. And you're allowed to do that. He encourages that. That's a loving father. But how would you feel if your kid only spoke to you? Dad, I need $20. Hey, look. Dad, can you do this? Hey, come down. Come down. Hey, Dad, I need another $50. Can you help me with this? And just be honest. When you saw your kid coming, you'd run. You'd be like, I, I, I am out. I got nothing. This is what we do. Do y'all, do y'all have that one friend? I use the word friend in quotes who only reaches out to you when they need something. I got one. I only hear from them when they need something. Don't be that guy. Don't be that guy. Seek his face. So much of our praying is consumed with seeking something from God before we love him, before we thank him, before we say, God, I have some physical needs, I have some material needs. It's all consumed with personal stuff. The last thing he tells you, oh, I wish I didn't have to go here, but we do. The fourth thing he demands from his people is to turn from their wicked ways. I'm just going to sit down. This is so hard. Turn from their wicked ways. Sin that is unconfessed is the key reason revival tarries. Unconfessed sin severs not your relationship with God. It severs your fellowship. It's the cloud that moves between you and the sun. Does that make sense? unconfessed sin. It is the leading reason. King David tried to hide his sin. Even Solomon said this in Proverbs 28. He said, he who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Wow. You want mercy? There's the formula right there. And King David shows up and he says, I didn't sin. I'm going to hide my sin. And then the prophet Samuel shows up, and he tells him this story about a greedy man who stole someone's sheep that didn't belong to him. And then, man, that just slapped David right in the face. And it hurt, and it was tough. And after the consequences, David's cries and brokenness drew him back to God. And now we know him today as a man after God's own heart. Anybody want to be known as that? Yes. Sign me up for that list. Minus the affair and having a husband killed and stuff. I don't need that part of it. But this, is, this is a formula here that God is showing us. The promise that we find in David's life still extends to you. God's wanting to give you forgiveness. He is wanting to give you restoration. But you must repent of sins. Is that popular today? You hear that a lot? No. No. But it doesn't matter because we're not here to be popular. We're here to be peculiar to be different, to be noticeably different in a world that loves to squash us into the same mold. This is why, and it, it, let, me, let me say this, there's a huge difference between being sorry for sin and forsaking sin. This is not about, I'm sorry I got caught. Everybody's sorry they got caught. It's not about that. It's not about condoning it. It is more than just saying, Lord, I apologize for it. And I express remorse. It is forsaking it and turning your back 180 degrees and walking in full repentance, embracing God's forgiveness and saying, forgive me, Lord, a sinner. May I never go back into those chains again. I repent. I turn my back and I embrace you. Holy Spirit, shine your light into me. Man, that's tough medicine, I know. But guess what? There's always good news. I'll always, always, always leave you with something awesome to send you out with a victorious note, okay? Are you ready for this? This all leads to what God delights in doing. God delights in sending revival. It's what he wants to do. He wants to show up. He wants to say, okay, I have heard. I hear from heaven. I'll forgive your sin, and I will heal your land. I want to send you revival. That's his delight, to cleanse us of our sin. Thank you, Lord. Hear me. If you haven't heard anything else, leave with this. God delights more in healing your heart, in healing your marriage, in healing your home than even you do. That's how much he loves you. He wants to heal your broken marriage and your screwed up home and all of the things that are going crazy in your world. He wants to to work in your life even more than you do. He loves you. You know how we know that? Because he uses familial relationships for us, taking on names like father and son. When your kid comes to you 
with a broken and contrite heart. Let's just bring it personal. Let's say my sweet, precious, almost perfect Mary comes up and she's, she's done something to hinder our relationship, okay, to, to, to sever. She's done something, okay? This is not a true story, okay? Don't be thinking, I wonder what she's done, okay? It's not about that. But if she comes up to me and she is generally repentant and she looks up, those big blue eyes, and tears are streaming down her face. She says, Daddy, I am so sorry. I am so, so sorry. Can you find it in your heart to forgive me? It will never happen again. How do you think I'm going to react to that? I want to restore that relationship. Of course I'm going to forgive her. She comes up, looks up, Daddy, and she wants to give me a big hug. You think I'm going to be like, sorry. <laughs> Talk to the hand. I'm not, no. No! We'll be like, come here, baby. If we being evil, know how to give good things to our kids, how much more so does our perfect Heavenly Father know? He wants to forgive. We just need to repent. And that is the part of the coin that many churches do not say anymore. It involves us. There's the condition. It's not this universalism. God loves everybody. Everybody hug. We are the world. We are the children. It's not what Jesus preached. But I'm the way, I'm the truth. No one comes to the Father but through me. That's how you find it, through repentance at the foot of the cross. Saying, God, I agree with you. Have you done this? Have you, have you come to the point where God has shown a light in your heart and said, you know what? My best rags, are, are, they're filthy, and that's my best, and he's here. And it's almost like all have sinned and fallen short of his glory, and I think I've read that somewhere, and I'm, I'm wondering. And, and God says, I can fix that. You can't fix it in your own power. You can't earn it. You can't work it. You're not saved because of your works. You're saved, and then you do great works. How about that? In his power. Have you done that? God wants to restore the homes and our hearts and heal us, but we have to call out on him. That is God's recipe for personal revival. It's not that difficult. It's actually very simple. It just means we have to be obedient and follow his recipe. So how are you doing with it? Can I pray for you? Let's do that. God, I thank you for the power and the simplicity of your word. Lord, forgive us for prayerlessness. Forgive us for arrogance, for not having humility. Forgive us for any times, Lord, that we have been unrepentant. Lord, forgive us for the times where all we have done is seek your hand instead of seeking your face and just worshiping you and saying thank you first before we dare ask for more. Lord, you have blessed us in so many ways. You are a good, good father. You're so worthy of our worship and our obedience and our surrender. And Lord, we give that to you. Not only individually, Lord, but as a church, we want to serve you. We know that you are doing a fresh, good work here, and we don't want to miss it. God, help our sin not to be a barrier that robs us of that blessing. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name. 